Okay, chapter two, section six, limits at infinity and uh, horizontal asymptotes. Okay, consider the function f of x equals to seven x squared minus one divided by two x squared plus one. What we're interested in in this section is exploring what happens when we input values that are very large, very large in the positive direction or very large in the negative direction. So to explore that, let's start off by using technology. Uh, so let's go to Desmos. Okay, so here in Desmos, I've used the table feature uh, to put the equation that we're interested in right here. So what this will do is automatically calculate the uh, output for various x inputs. So for example, if we put a zero in here, then this is zero squared times seven minus one, which is just gonna be minus one, divided by, and then zero squared times two plus one, that's just gonna be one. So we just get a negative one in the denominator. Okay, and then we can, um, it'll automatically graph it over here so we can get a, a visual of that ordered pair, zero comma negative one. Okay, we can put a couple of other points. Let's put um, let's put two or one. So one leads to two. So one squared times seven minus one is going to be six. One squared uh, times two plus one is three. Six over three is two. That's how we get that two. Okay, so we can put in a two. We can put in a three, and we start to see these ordered pairs here, 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 and here. Right. If we wanted a smoother looking uh, picture, then you know we don't have to stick to the whole numbers. We could also put some fractions. So we could put 0 0.5 and we can put um, 1.5 and 2.5 and we start to see that, okay? However, what we're interested in is what happens as the inputs get larger and larger and larger. So let's just jump to 10 for instance. So when the input is 10, the output is 3.4776. We get this ordered pair there. But we're interested in seeing what happens uh, and examining what happens to this function as the inputs get larger and larger and larger. So let's put some values here, about 20, about 30, about 40, about 50, about 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, and as we can see, uh, the ordered pairs seem to be reaching a maximum height. They seem to be plateauing out to something. They're converging toward a particular point. So there are some equations where the larger the input, the larger the output, they grow toward infinity. Uh, but there's gonna be some equations out there where the larger the input, the outputs begin to get closer and closer to some constant value. Okay, if we continued to graph more and more of these points, we'd eventually get a nice smooth curvature that would look like this. So then this green curvature is the graph of that uh, rational function. We can see that they are approaching some constant value and that constant value is the line uh, y equals to three of the seven over two, which is 3.5. Okay, um, and we can see from the table here as well, probably uh, even better really, that the output values are getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to 3.5. They never quite equal 3.5. Uh, we can get really, really close. 3.499775 is pretty close, and that's just with an input of 100. If I wanted to get ridiculously close, you know, we can jump even higher. How about 1,000? That's even closer uh, than before. Or you see the pattern. We can just keep getting closer and closer and closer and closer uh, to a positive infinity. The We can get closer and closer to 3.5 by inputting values that get larger and larger uh, in the positive x-axis direction. Okay, we can duplicate this on our calculator. Go over to y. one, close parentheses. Okay, so we have our value in our y. We're gonna go over to the table, second shift, delete all values from there. 
delete, delete, delete. Okay, so zero led to negative one, uh, one led to two, then three, then four, we jumped over to 10 maybe. Uh, 20, 30, 50, 100, okay, so we see that the numbers are getting closer and closer and closer and closer to 3.5. And then here the calculator says 3.5. Remember, it's lying to you. It just is rounding it there. If we want a more precise answer here, we've got to use our arrows, go up, go across, and there it is. So now we see it is very, very close to 3.5. So that's what we're getting. The outputs are growing toward 3.5 as the inputs are growing toward positive infinity. What about the other direction? Okay, what if they were growing toward negative infinity? So we see that if, let's try that, start off at zero, put a negative uh, five, about a negative 10, about a negative Okay, and again, we can use our arrows here to highlight that value and get a more precise answer. So it looks like they're heading toward 3.5 anyway, in both directions, as the input values grow toward positive infinity, but also as they grow toward negative infinity in both directions, the outputs keep getting closer and closer to 3.5. If we go back to Desmos, we see that the same thing happens over here. If I put in a negative, uh, negative 10, still a value that's very close to uh, 3.5. And then I can do negative uh, 50, negative 100. Either way, I'm getting closer and closer to 3.5 in either direction. So if I wanted to see the graph, I can scoot this over and I can see that this is what's happening. Okay. And in fact, this particular equation uh, grows toward 3.5 quite quickly, right? So you can see that this thing shoots up toward 3.5 quite quickly. You know, uh, pictures can be deceiving a little bit, so we can manipulate this uh, and, you know, get a better looking picture. Okay, so we had that this right here is the equation f of x equals to 7x squared minus 1 divided by 2x squared plus 1. We see that's the curvature. And we see pretty quickly, really at uh, x equals to 6, it's already pretty close to this 3.5. Uh, but the farther we go this direction, and here's the x-axis, the farther we go in this direction, the closer our function gets to the line y equals to 3.5, which is really the 7 over 2, 7 over 2 or 3.5. So the notation we want to adopt is to say that the limit as x goes toward infinity of this function is equal to 3.5. Okay, so that's going in this direction. And then in the other direction, we want to focus over here. We want to say that as x approaches negative infinity, so the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of my function, 7x squared minus 1 divided by 2x squared plus 1, that this limit also equals to 3.5. So in this, in, in this particular case, whether you're heading toward positive or negative infinity, uh, in both situations, the function is heading in the same place. Uh, it's getting infinitely close to this red line, getting infinitely uh, close to the output of 3.5. In this case, it doesn't ever actually equal to 3.5, uh, but we might have a situation where that is the case. So there might be a graph where it happens to be equal to that 3.5 value at one point, uh, but that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in what happens as this goes toward infinity, as it gets infinitely large. There might be functions where 
it might do all kinds of weird wiggly things for a long time uh, and it may not uh, appear to be heading in any particular direction until the input values begin to get really large. Right? So look out for that. All right, let's write down or let's look at the formal description of this. Okay, so in general, this is going to be our definition, um, intuitive definition of the limit at infinity, right? So this is where the input values are heading toward positive infinity. Let f be a function defined on some interval from a to infinity, then the limit as x approaches to infinity of f of x is equal to l, means that the values of f of x can be made arbitrarily close to l by requiring x to be sufficiently large. Right? That's, that's the uh, definition of, uh, of this, of a limit at infinity. So here's some nice pictures to go along with that. Right? So this is the standard notation. And, uh, so here's the standard notation, the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equals to l. Uh, but this is another way to describe it. The output f of x is going toward capital L as x is going toward positive infinity. Okay, so in all of these pictures, the blue is the actual function f of x. Okay, L is not part of the, uh, of the graph of f of x. It's just identifying that um, there's a line there and that our output function is getting infinitely close to that value. It might take a long time. Notice that there's no scaling on these. It might take a very long time before this pattern becomes apparent. So for example, it might be, you know, there's some equation here and when I input, you know, what someone might think is a relatively large number, how about 100? It might be that 100 is there. You're like, oh, that doesn't seem like a pattern. And then maybe uh, it takes a while, maybe 200, here's 200 is there and you still don't quite see the pattern. Maybe it doesn't, it, it doesn't get close to that capital L until we get to at least 1,000. And that's just an arbitrarily selected value. Maybe it takes even longer than that. Maybe this is a different scale where this is 1,000 and you're still there and 2,000 and you're still there. So it doesn't appear to get close to there until you get to at least 10,000, maybe. We're talking about cases where X is going toward positive infinity. So these can be very large numbers. The example that I did a little bit ago, we saw that it approached that value 3.5 quite quickly but it might take a while, right? So that's what we're interested in, finding um, a pattern of our function as the input values grow toward positive infinity. So our function could do this. It could uh, you know, wiggle around, wiggle around, and then eventually uh, at some point it becomes apparent that this becomes infinitely close to L. Um, or it could come from this, uh, it could look like this. So in this first case, the function approached it from below. In this case, the function is kind of approaching it from above. And then there could be a case like this where it kind of wiggles up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, but it is getting closer. Notice that the amplitude of the, of the periods of this are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's wiggling up and down, but it, it is uh, converging toward that value as well. And again, there's no scaling on this axis, so it might be that it takes a very long time for this to eventually work its way uh, to getting really, really close to this line, y equals to l, but that's okay. We're interested in cases when x goes toward infinity, right? So as this becomes infinitely large, um, what's happening to our output? Also notice that uh, there are some cases where the function is equal to l. So notice that in this little picture here, there's a point right there where my function equals to L that doesn't have anything to do with anything. Uh, it's allowed, uh, but that's not really the point, right? We care about what happens as the output, uh, uh, what, what happens to the outputs as the inputs grow toward infinity. And then in this case, we have this other situation where my function is equal to L an infinite number of times. It, goes up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. So it equals to capital L all the time. And again, that's not the point. My, my real interest is what is happening to all of the function outputs 
uh, beyond a certain point. Good. As x grows toward infinity, where is this function heading to? That's what we're interested in. Here's an example. Um, you know, this is similar to, to the one we were working on. Um, this is this is one of the examples in your book. It has a nice little picture, so I thought I'd throw it on there. So here, here we have another example where we have our function y equals to x squared minus 1, x squared plus 1. And so its graph looks like this. And we see that it's approaching the line y equals to 1. So uh, just to practice the notation, we would say that this function here, uh, in this in this direction over here, over here, we would say the limit as x approaches to positive infinity of x squared minus 1 divided by x squared plus 1 equals to 1. Right? It seems to be heading toward 1 as x grows toward positive infinity. And then over here in this direction, it seems to be doing something very similar. The limit as x approaches to negative infinity of x squared minus 1 divided by x squared plus 1, it also seems to be heading toward positive 1. Okay, um, so similar to definition 1, we have that uh, if f is a function defined on some interval from negative infinity to some constant a, then the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of f of x equals to capital L means that the value of f of x can be made arbitrarily close to capital L by requiring x to be sufficiently large negative values. So this is the exact same definition as in definition one. The only thing that has changed is here that we're defining what it means for x to go toward uh, large in the negative direction. So the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of f of x is equal to capital L. In the other case, in definition one, we had a positive infinity. So very similar ideas. And here's some other graphs that show you what it could look like. These are just examples of what could it, it could look like when a function is uh, approaching capital L as x grows toward negative infinity, right? So negative goes that way. So as the x values grow larger and larger and larger into the negative infinity direction, our output values are getting closer and closer and closer and closer to this capital L. Oops, they're converging toward this capital L. So here's an example where they're approaching it from the top. It's approaching it from the top. And here's an example where it crosses through it a couple of times, there and there, has nothing to do with this question. We're interested in what happens as the inputs grow toward the negative infinity direction that way, right? Negative infinity. And there's no scaling on these. So again, maybe it gets really close to L fairly quickly. Like maybe this is one, negative one and then negative two and then by negative three, it's already pretty close. Maybe that's the case. Or maybe it takes a lot more. Maybe you have to plug in negative 30,000 and maybe the scaling is a little bit different, like this. It might be that at negative 10,000, it's way down here, you don't really see any patterns. At negative 20,000, okay, we're getting a little closer. By negative 30,000, we start to see that it's getting closer. And then negative 50,000, negative 100,000, negative a million, right? Luckily, we're going toward negative infinity, so we can go pretty, pretty far down toward the left. Okay, so again, just to practice our notation, this is indicating that the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of f of x, since the actual equation was not given, is equal to capital L, right? Again, the actual value of L is not given. So this is the notation that would apply to both functions. The limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x equals to capital L. Okay, definition three. The line y equals to l is called a horizontal asymptote of the curve y equals to f of x if either the limit as x approaches to infinity of f of x equals to l or if the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x equals to l, right? So again, the only distinction between these two is that this one is positive and this one is negative. 
right? So we have here, we have going toward negative infinity. Here we have going toward positive infinity. So if either one of those exists, then the line y equals to L is a horizontal asymptote of the function. Okay, note that there is, uh, it is possible for the function to converge to a horizontal asymptote as x approaches to infinity that is uh, different from a horizontal asymptote as, uh, x, uh, as x approaches negative infinity. Right, so the function could approach one number as x goes toward positive infinity and then approach a separate number as x approaches to negative infinity. It could have two separate horizontal asymptotes. A very famous example for that one uh, is tangent inverse. So remember that if we have, um, for example, um, f of x equal to tangent, the tangent function... We remember that the tangent function, just to kind of do a rough little sketch, looks like this. If you remember from your trig class, um, the tangent function is going to have asymptotes there and there. And the asymptotes are going to create something that looks like this. So the blue is the tangent function. And these asymptotes occur at the lines x equal to positive pi over 2, asymptotes, vertical asymptotes at x equals to pi over 2, and um, at x equals to negative pi over 2. Right? So this is what one period of the tangent function looks like. And then, of course, it repeats itself and repeats itself on both sides. Let's label this as um, f of x, and then this is x, and then this little guy right there is f of x equals to tangent of x. Okay, so then when we want to think about the tangent inverse function, uh, we know that what we want to do is flip-flop all the ordered pairs. So if there is some value here a that maps there to some output b, then we want to graph the ordered pair b comma a, right? The inverse function. Okay. Hopefully you remember that uh, from your pre-calculus class. So if we want to graph uh, some new function g of x, which is equal to tangent inverse of x, like that, then its graph is going to look like this. It's going to have horizontal asymptotes there and there and our graph is going to come like this and go through there and go through there like that so this will be our function g of x which is equal to the tangent inverse and there'll be horizontal asymptotes here at um, y equals to pi over 2 and here at y equals to negative pi over 2 right and that's where one of these little ordered pair values in here will be the ordered pair b leads to a good 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 okay so here is an example of a function tangent inverse of x uh, that has two different horizontal asymptotes. And I have a better picture of this. So here's a nicer picture of that. Right, so here we have that um, this is the line y equals to pi over 2. This is the line y equals to negative pi over 2. This is our function. This, this guy here is our function tangent inverse of x and we would write that as x goes toward positive infinity as the input values uh, for x get larger and larger and larger and larger and larger and they head toward infinity the output values get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to the line to this line which is the line y equals to pi over 2 they get closer to that 
So we would write that down as the limit as x approaches to positive infinity of tangent inverse of x equals to pi over 2. And in the other direction, as x grows toward negative infinity, so let's say we choose that as the input, there's my output, and then we go closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to negative infinity. We're heading toward negative infinity that way. We see that our output values will become closer and closer and closer to this line, which is the line y equals to negative pi over 2, right? Infinitely close to it. So we would describe that phenomenon there for this function as the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of my function tangent inverse of x equals to negative pi over 2. Okay, so it just takes a little getting used to with this notation, and you just have to really practice uh, what it means, right? This, this limit, this limit notation, the limit as x goes to infinity, as the input values of my function grow toward positive infinity, they get infinitely large in the positive direction, that this function, its outputs would get infinitely close to pi over 2. Right? Notice that they never actually equal pi over 2. There's no specific unique value of x that I could choose such that tangent inverse of that number equals to exactly pi over 2. They just get infinitely close to it. I can get as close to it as I want to get um, by choosing the appropriate value of x, I can get infinitely close to it, but never actually equal to exactly pi over 2. Okay, so this is a very famous example where there are two horizontal asymptotes. This is a horizontal asymptote because, it, because of this definition. The limit as x goes to positive infinity of tangent inverse of x equals to pi over 2. So this is one horizontal asymptote, whereas this is another horizontal asymptote. So two horizontal asymptotes to this function. Right? So this is a, such a popular case that your book decided to give it to you in a nice blue box. So from time to time, it's one of those uh, useful mathematical trivia things that you can pull out you know, and uh, impress people. So limit as x goes to negative infinity of tangent inverse of x equals to negative pi over 2. And the limit as x goes to positive infinity of tangent inverse of x equals to positive pi over 2. Okay, so sometimes they might just give you a graph like this with some sort of function uh, drawn on it and no actual equation. Uh, and what we could do is we could just analyze the graph and uh, write down some limits. Um, or they might ask you, uh, they might prompt you to write down some limits, but let's, let's write down some limits from here. Uh, first of all, re recalling our work from before, we know that if there is a constant, say here, for example, 0, such that as the input values x get closer and closer and closer to that value from one direction, they get infinitely large in the negative direction. Right? That's one phenomenon we studied before. These are vertical asymptotes. Right? Same thing happens over here at 2. As x gets closer and closer and closer, as we choose values to get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to the number 2 from the right-hand side, the outputs of my function appear to be heading toward positive infinity. So let's write that down. The limit as x approaches to 2 from the right-hand side of my function, since it doesn't have a, any other uh, identification, I'm just going to call, call it f of x, of f of x, the limit as x approaches 2 from the right-hand side of f of x is equal to positive infinity. Right? That's not a number. It's a direction. It's an idea. It's growing infinitely large, right? which means that uh, the limit does not exist. It's just it doesn't exist in this way, in that it's growing toward positive infinity. On the other hand, if we approach 2 from the other direction, we choose an x value here, and then closer and closer and closer and closer to 2, but never actually 2, and always right below 2, like 1.9, 1 1.99, 1 1.9999. We get really close to 2. The outputs are growing toward negative infinity. So let's write that down. The limit as x approaches to 2 from the left-hand side of f of x is equal to negative infinity. Okay, well, because... Um, 
they don't match, one's going toward positive infinity, one's going toward negative infinity, then the unrestricted limit as x approaches to 2 without restricting either side of f of x, well, we can't even really say positive or negative infinity, so we would just put does not exist. Right? These also don't exist. They also are not limits. The, the limit fails, but they fail in a special way, so we can at least kind of classify how they don't exist. They don't exist because it goes toward infinity. They don't exist because they go to negative infinity. But here we can't even really say that since it's the unrestricted one. So we could just say the limit as x approaches to 2 does not exist. Okay, now right around uh, 0, then notice, notice that for that one, the limit as x approaches to 0 from the right-hand side of my function. As we approach 0 from the right-hand side, the outputs are growing toward negative infinity. So this equals negative infinity. Therefore, it doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist in this special manner in that it's growing toward negative infinity. The limit as x approaches to 0 from the left-hand side of my function f of x is also growing toward negative infinity, right? So here is x, and it's growing closer and closer and closer and closer to 0, but always from the left-hand side. We see that our outputs are all growing toward negative infinity. So this is negative infinity. Well, in this case, since they at least match, then the unrestricted limit can be just written this way. The limit as x approaches to 0 of f of x is just equal to negative infinity. It still doesn't exist, but at least it doesn't exist in a special way that we can identify. It doesn't exist because it's growing uncontrollably toward negative infinity. Okay, so those are vertical asymptotes, and if we wanted to make this graph, graph nice and pretty, uh, to really identify them, then we often include these asymptotes like this. We would include a line here or a line here to really identify those values. And so it looks like this green line would be x equals to, oops, sorry, oh yeah, x equals to 0. And this one would be the line x equals to 2. Right? The green lines are not part of my graph, but we often include them to kind of uh, put some structure to our, to our graph. Okay, all right, now what about the limits at infinity? As the, output, uh, as the input values get infinitely large, so here's x, and we want to choose a larger and larger and larger and larger and larger, and we want to grow that way toward infinity, we see that the output function, the, the function, the output, seem to be heading closer and closer and closer and closer to this line. It seems to be one of those cases where it's kind of oscillating up and down, up and down, up and down, but it looks like they're all getting really close. They seem to be getting really close to this line here, which is the line y equals to 2. Good. And then in the other direction, as x gets closer and closer to negative infinity, so as it grows toward negative infinity, we get larger and larger and larger and larger output values that seem to be all heading closer and closer to this line. Where this line seems to be the line y equals to negative 1. Okay, so we would write that down as the limit as x approaches to positive infinity, as the output I'm sorry, as the input values grow infinitely large in the positive direction, my function f of x seems to be getting really, really close to 2. Right? Don't misunderstand this notation. This doesn't mean that the answer is going to be 2. f of x might be 2, as it is in a couple of cases here. But this is saying as the input values grow infinitely large, the output function values get infinitely close to 2. Right? Remember, the other style notation is that um, f of x is growing toward 2 as x is growing toward infinity. Right? That's another way of describing the same thing here. Right? And then in the other direction, we have that the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of f of x, 
is growing toward negative one. Right? And I'll put another or. We can also say that f of x is growing toward negative one as x is growing toward negative infinity. Okay, so the line y equals to two and the line y equals to negative one are horizontal asymptotes. Okay, so horizontal asymptotes at lines y equals to two and y equals to negative one and vertical asymptotes at x equals to zero and x equals to two. Okay, now let's uh, explore this very famous example. Uh, what if we just have the equation uh, 1 over x and we want to explore what happens uh, as the input values grow toward positive infinity? Well, again, we can create a table and we can use technology, but in fact, um, it's pretty easy to work with this one. So I'm just going to rough it here. So let's say we had a table like this and I had my function value 1 over x and I input uh, 1. Well, of course, 1 over 1 is just going to be equal to 1. Uh, what if I input 10? Well, I'll have 1 divided by 10, and we know that that must be equal to 0 0.1. And if the input is 100, then the output is going to be then we have 1 over 100, and the output is going to be 0 0.01. Right, so we see that there's this very nice pattern that happens with powers of 10, right? because we have a, a base 10 number system. So powers of 10 work out quite nicely in our system, and these little patterns exist. So if we put 1,000 there, We've learned that our pattern is now going to be that we put 0 0.001, right? The decimal gets moved, right? If you, the pattern that we notice is we start with one there. When we have one zero, we move the decimal from there one time. And when we have two zeros, then we move the decimal once, twice. When we have three zeros, we move them over once, twice, three times. And we keep going with that pattern. So it's a very nice pattern that we can continue to, uh, to expand on. So if we just really jump the gun here and put in a bunch of zeros, how about one with one, two, three, four, five, six zeros, um, that would be one million. Then this would be one over, and then one with one, two, three, four, five, six zeros which would mean that this is 0 0.12345 and a 1. Very, very small. Okay, the only pattern we really want to focus on for the purposes of this is that whenever we have a fraction where we have um, a 1 over something that's getting larger, larger in the denominator, then the whole result is getting smaller. And that's a general pattern that happens with fractions. As this grows larger and we have a constant there, then one divided by a larger and larger and larger and larger number means that we get a smaller and smaller amount. Okay. So like one million dollars divided amongst eight people. Okay, that's a that's decent. But one million dollars divided amongst 32 people, you know your output is going to be much smaller. You're going to get a much smaller share of that million dollars, right? Okay, um, anyway, so that relationship holds true. Um, and that's also going to be true if you're going toward the negative direction. Because if I was going to be inputting negative numbers to this, okay, well, let's say uh, instead of one, I put a negative one. Okay, well then that means I'll put a negative one there, which means that this would be negative one. And if I put in a negative 10 there, well then this is negative 10, which means that this is negative 0 0.1. And likewise throughout here. And either way, we see that the output values are growing toward zero. Right? That's what we want to conclude here. Let's use Desmos to do this, this exact same thing. They do a nice job of graphing it. 
Okay, so we're back with Desmos, and notice, of course, that if we let x equal to 0 exactly, we have 1 over 0, which means it's undefined. So just let's ignore that for now. We don't want to put that in there. But we tried putting 1. Okay, 1 leads to 1, so here's the ordered pair 1, comma 1. And then we tried putting in a 10. 10 leads to point 0.1, that's going to be this guy right there. And then we try putting 100, which leads to point, oh, that's way off scale over there. So I'd have to change this. So there's that point, 100 comma 0 0.001. And then, of course, now if I put in 1,000, that would be way, 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 way over here. So I'm going to have to change this scale again. Okay, so here are the points I have so far. And what we get out of this is that it is growing to zero and it's growing there pretty quickly. If I keep going and continue to draw these, I'll see that this equals to So if I just graph the equation 1 over x, we see this graph right here. And we see that we get the same results in the other direction as x grows toward negative infinity. We have negative 1 there negative 10 there, negative 100 there, negative 1,000 there. Either way, the outputs get closer and closer to zero, but from the other side. So the graph begins to look like this. Good. So this is a very famous uh, graph. This is the graph of 1 over x. And we should get from here that the limit as x goes toward positive infinity of this function, 1 over x, grows toward zero. And the limit as x grows toward negative infinity of 1 over x grows toward 0. And there's also a vertical asymptote here at 0, at, at the line uh, x equals to 0. But here's a nicer graph of the exact same thing. So we have this is our uh, function, y equals to 1 over x. And we should get two things out of this. The limit as x grows toward positive infinity. As we choose input values to get larger and larger and larger and larger as x grows that way, the output values get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, right? If the inputs get larger and larger and larger and larger, the whole fraction gets smaller and smaller and gets closer and closer and closer to zero. And that's what this is describing. The limit as x goes toward positive infinity of 1 over x equals to zero. And also in the other direction, as x grows toward negative infinity, gets larger and larger and larger and larger in the negative direction as it grows that way. And the output values get closer and closer to zero. Uh, the only difference is that in this case, all of these output values are always going to be negative. Whereas in this case, all the output values are always going to be positive. Uh, but either way, they're approaching zero. Whether they're approaching zero coming from the positive side or approaching zero coming from the negative side, either way, they're approaching zero. Okay, so this is a very a uh, very popular, very famous example uh, gives us a horizontal asymptote at the line uh, y equals to zero. And the line y equals to zero is also often referred to as the x-axis. Right, an asymptote at the x-axis. And also we can see from our graph that the y-axis is also going to be a vertical asymptote at x equals to 0, or otherwise sometimes referred to as the y-axis. Right? And we could have written that down by noting that the limit, the limit as x approaches to 0 from the right-hand side of 1 over x is heading toward positive infinity. In the right-hand side of 0, the outputs are heading toward positive infinity. And the limit, as x approaches to 0 from the left-hand side of 1 over x, is approaching negative infinity. Right? They're approaching negative infinity. Okay, well, all of this leads to a generalization of what happens with functions that fit a particular form. And this is the theorem that we have to adopt. If r is positive, 
greater than zero is a rational number, then the limit as x approaches to infinity of one over x to the r power is gonna be zero. If r is positive, is a rational number such that r to x to the r power is defined for all x, then the limit as x grows to negative infinity of one over x to the r power is also going to be equal to zero. Okay, so um, in the case that we just looked at, we were just looking at the simple case when r equals to one. So let's write that down. If r equals to one, then we would have the case of one over x to the power of one. And we just saw that the limit of this guy the limit as x approaches to infinity of this equals to zero. So we just showed why that's true here for the case when r equals to one. As x goes toward infinity, uh, you have x to the power of one. We saw that it was gonna have a limit that grows towards zero. Well, this theorem is saying that it doesn't have to be just the one there. You can put any other number that satisfies this r has to be positive, strictly greater than zero, and a rational number. So for example, it could be the number three. We can put a three there, we can put a three there. Three is a positive uh, rational number, so um, this is gonna be true according to this theorem. It could be, um, it could be a fractional number too. Like, let's say that this is one half, this could be one half as well, and that is also going to be true. Okay. As long as r is a rational number, remember rational is a fancy word for fractional number. So it could be one half, it could be uh, four fifths, seven thirds, something like that. The only thing we haven't quite gotten to, at least this theorem does not address, is what if it's an irrational number, right? So for example, what if r was something fancy like pi, what is x to the pi power? Well, this doesn't address it, so let's not deal with it now. You're not gonna have to deal with it in this section, not yet, that's fun for the future. So for now, we're just gonna stick to the, the, the letter of the, of the theorem here, which is that it's telling us it's true for rational numbers, rational numbers, good? Uh, remember, rational number is a number that can be expressed as a fraction, um, and so if we divide it, we either get a terminating decimal or a, a decimal that begins to have a pattern that repeats itself, right? Definition of a rational number. Okay, um, and then in the other direction, as x approaches to negative infinity, the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of one over x to the power of something. Okay, again, we saw what happened uh, when if r equals to one, we saw that, and we saw that that also equal to zero. Okay, but this thing is saying, again, we could use any rational number, so we can re rewrite that as one, or we can go, okay, well, we don't want one. It can also work if this was uh, a seven, put a seven there. Remember, the input values are negative now, so we have to be careful about which choices we, we pick because as we're putting in negative numbers, um, if we put a number here that results in an uh, imaginary number, then we have issues, right? So, for example, if we put in... If we let r equal to positive one half, one half, remember that x to the one half power is the same thing as the square root of x. And now if I'm inputting negative numbers, negatives are gonna result in imaginary numbers. And that's not what we want right now. Again, that's fun for another day. Uh, but what we're, what we're, this language right here that says such that x to the r power is defined for all uh, for all x. That's just 
letting you know, let's just avoid the R values that are going to cause an imaginary number. And we're just going to avoid those for now. But all the other ones are fine. So as long as you don't uh, uh, result in a value where we have a negative and then we have an even root, even index here. An even root, square root of a negative, that leads to an imaginary. And we just want to avoid that for now. Okay, so notice that I didn't actually prove this theorem, so there was no formal proof. Uh, we just showed what happens when we had the really simple case of 1 over x, and hopefully I've convinced you of what the graph looks like and that you're properly convinced that as the input values of x get infinitely large, 1 over x gets infinitely close to 0. So hopefully that limit is you know, crystal clear. And then we just jump into the conclusion that if we have something that fits this pattern of 1 over x to the r power, uh, where r is a positive rational number, that this limit will also be equal to 0. But we didn't do a formal proof. That's OK. You just have to understand it and use it and apply it. And it's one of the most uh, useful theorems we'll have for this section uh, because it lets us do the following. Well, obviously, if we have uh, a question that looks like this, if you're simply asked to find the limit as x approaches to infinity of 1 over x to the fourth power, well, then that's just easy. You can just look at it here and go, oh, okay, I guess r equals to, here r equals to 4. So by theorem 5, we just know that this is equal to 0. Easy, right? But it goes beyond that because actually we can use this to solve much more complicated cases such as the following. Find the limit of f of x equal to 5x squared minus 2x plus 3 divided by 4x squared plus 3x minus 6. And we want to find the limit as x grows toward infinity, positive infinity first, and then we'll look at negative infinity uh, second. Okay, well, on initial inspection, it's kind of hard to just look at this and know what's going to happen because uh, as I input very, very, very large positive numbers, I know that this is going to grow big. A large number squared times 5 is a very large number. Minus 2 times a large number, well, you know, what do we do with that? Uh, so we have to do a little bit of algebra to manipulate this and get it to a point where we have several cases of theorem 5 that will help us. So this is what we want to do. Uh, we want to find the limit as x approaches to infinity of this function f of x is equal to the limit as x approaches to infinity of 5x squared minus 2x plus 3 all over 4x squared plus 3x minus 6. Okay, so this is the limit of this fraction right here. The trick we're going to do is to do a little bit of algebraic manipulation to rewrite this. And what we want to do is figure out the highest degree of the a polynomial in the denominator. So in this case, it's this 2. And so what we want to do is to uh, multiply the numerator and denominator by uh, the following. So you want to multiply the numerator and the denominator by 1 over x squared and 1 over x squared. Together, these two things are identical, so they're a new version of 1, right? That's why we're allowed to multiply by it. This is a new version of 1. It does not affect the actual uh, value of our fraction. And now we can uh, break this up. We can distribute. And so this is equal to... Okay, so all I did is distribute this across there and across there and across there, multiplied by each one of those terms. And same thing in the denominator, multiplied it by the first one, multiplied it by the second one, multiplied it by the third one. And so we end up with this. And then a bunch of canceling can happen. 
So now we see that x squared and x squared cancel and x squared and x squared cancel. And here they reduce a little bit. Here we have one x. So that one cancels with that guy. There's still one left over. This one cancels with one of those. There's still one left over. And then nothing reduces there. Okay, so then that leads to the following. Okay, so that leads to the following. Uh, here in this uh, first term in the numerator, the x squares cancel, leaving you just a 5. Then minus 2 over x, since one of the x's survive. And then finally plus 3 over x squared. That's in the numerator. And in, in, in the denominator, we end up with a 4 there, and then 3 over x there, and then a 6 over x squared there. Okay, so now all the properties of limits that we learned from before, almost all of them still apply. So uh, one of those properties was that if we have a limit of a fraction like this, then we can find the limit of the numerator, the limit of the denominator separately, and then divide them. All right, so that's the property I'm going to use here. So the limit of this entire fraction is equal to this entire fraction where we have to find the limit of the numerator and then separately the limit of the denominator. Also we have um, properties of limits to say that if we have an addition or subtraction we can find them separately. So this numerator becomes the limit as x approaches to infinity of 5 minus the limit as x approaches infinity of 2 over x plus the limit as x approaches infinity of 3 over x squared divided by the limit as x approaches infinity of 4 plus the limit as x approaches infinity of 3 over x minus the limit as x approaches to infinity of 6 over x squared. So we know that the limit as x approaches infinity of a constant is equal to that constant. So again, using our properties from before, this is just going to be a 5, right? The output is always 5. It doesn't matter what the input is, whether it's small or large. As long as it's in the domain, the output is going to be that constant, right? This is that horizontal line, y equals to 5. And this is going to be the constant 4. Okay, for these, we can take advantage of one more property of limits, which says that if there's a constant, we can pull it out. So this is going to become 5 minus 2 times the limit as x approaches to infinity of 1 over x, plus 3 times the limit as x approaches to infinity of 1 over x squared, divided by 4 plus... 3 times the limit as x approaches to infinity of 1 over x minus 6 times the limit as x approaches to infinity of 1 over x squared. Okay. And now according to property 5, or theorem 5 that we just saw, all of these values approach towards 0. That'll be a 0, that'll be a 0, that'll be a zero, and that'll be a zero. So our entire fraction then becomes five minus two times zero plus three times zero divided by four plus three times zero minus six times zero. And zero times anything is zero, so that'll be zero, that'll be zero, that'll be zero, and that'll be zero. So the whole thing just equals to 5 over 4. And that's our answer for this limit, 5 fourths. So putting it all together, back to this original statement over here, this limit, uh, the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is equal to this, which is equal to that, it's equal to that. Well, we bring it all the way down, and we see that it equals this. So we can all tie it all together and say, that the limit as x approaches to infinity of 5x squared minus 2x plus 3 divided by 4x squared 
plus 3x minus 6 equals to 5 over 4. So bringing it all together, we could say the limit as x goes to infinity of 5x squared minus 2x plus 3 divided by 4x squared plus 3x minus, minus 6 is equal to 5 divided by 4. Okay, so this is a very popular, very common trick, algebraic trick that we do uh, to help us identify uh, the limit of a rational function. And remember, the trick was that if you have a rational function where the numerator and denominator are polynomials like this, uh, then what you want to do is find the, the highest power, the most appropriate power that will work here. In this case, it'll be uh, a 2, right? It's the highest power of the polynomial and the denominator. And then we want to do this. Uh, multiply the numerator and denominator of your fraction by 1 over x to the power of 2, again, because it's the highest one. And then this will work out nicely. If this had been a different problem where, you know, if this guy here had been an 8 there, then you'd have to divide by 1 over x to the 8th power, 1 over x to the 8th power, and then the appropriate thing would work out and we'd be able to find that limit. All right, now let's use Desmos to confirm this result. Okay, so here's what the graph looks like. And if we graph the horizontal line y equals to 5 divided by 4, We see the horizontal line y equals to 5 divided by 4 or 1.25. We see that our graph indeed gets infinitely close to it as the outputs head toward positive infinity. And we see from the graph that it's going to do the same thing in the other direction. It's heading toward uh, the horizontal line y equals to 4 fifths in either case. Okay. So the limit of our function, the green function, heads toward um, five-fourths as x goes toward positive or negative infinity. So this red line, the horizontal asymptote at the line y equals to five-fourths. And so we can write that the limit as x approaches to infinity of our function f of x, which was equal to 5x squared minus 2x plus 3 all over 4x squared plus 3x minus 6 is equal to 5 fourths. We can see that the function is getting infinitely close to 5 fourths as x approaches to positive infinity. And from my picture at least, I can see that the same thing is happening in the other direction. As x approaches to negative infinity, I didn't do the work, but I can see from my picture that it also heads toward 5 fourths. So I can write that down as the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of 5x squared minus 2x plus 3 all over 4x squared plus 3x minus 6 also equals to 5 fourths. Okay. All right, let's look at another example. Okay, f of x equals to the square root of uh, 3x squared plus 4 divided by 2x minus 7. So let's find all horizontal and vertical asymptotes. Okay, so first of all, vertical asymptotes. In order to find the vertical asymptotes when you're given a fraction like this, uh, step one is to think about all the input values that result in a zero in the denominator. Those values might be vertical asymptotes, though they are not guaranteed to be vertical asymptotes. So you're still going to have to do a little bit of more investigation beyond that. Uh, but that's a good place to start. So for us, we want to think about uh, the denominator being 2x minus 7. So let's set it equal to zero. And so we get that 2x is equal to positive 7, and so x equals to 7 divided by 2. So when x equals to 7 divided by 2, I'm going to get a, uh, uh, a 7 over 2, which becomes 0 in the denominator. 
And in the numerator, I get something that's not zero. That's, a, that's key to identifying this as a vertical asymptote. So note, So in the denominator, I'm going to end up with a zero if I do this, zero. And in the numerator, we get 49 divided by 4, 49 divided by 4, um, so 147 divided by 4 plus 4, square root of all that, square root of 40.75, and then that comes 6.38, 6.38 um, over zero, which we know is undefined, right? So it's undefined because there's a zero in the denominator. Uh, but when we want to think about a limit, so think about the limit as x approaches to seven direction then we're not going to be inputting exactly this number, so we're not going to be getting zero in the denominator, but we're going to get something really, really close to zero. Um, if it's always a little bit larger than zero, um, I'm sorry, if it's always a little bit larger than 7 over 2, which is 3.5, it's a little bit larger than 3.5, uh, 3.5 times 2 is going to be a little bit larger than 7, so this is always going to be something that is positive, very, very small, approaching zero, uh, but positive. In the, on the other hand, up in the numerator, uh, a, very, a number very, very close to 7 over 2 squared times 3 plus 4 square root of that is going to be very, very close to 6.38. So something that's approaching zero, getting infinitely small uh, in the positive, uh, but always positive, and the numerator approaching this number is going to result in a very large positive number. So that helps us kind of think our way through this and confirm that the, this is going toward positive infinity. So the limit as x approaches 7 over 2 from the positive side of our function f of x is going to be equal to positive infinity. Okay. On the other hand, the limit as x approaches 7 over 2 from the left-hand side Okay, let's think about what happens when we put in a number that's really close to 7 over 2, but always a little bit smaller from the left. When we double it, we'll get a number that's always a little bit less than 7. So the denominator will be something that's heading towards 0, but always negative. But negative. Whereas in the numerator, it doesn't matter uh, so much. If I'm getting close to this number, but always a little bit smaller, squared, times 3 plus 4, square root of that, I'm still getting really, really close to the number three, uh, 6 point, uh, 6.38, right? I'm approaching that number. It's approaching a constant. So this is approaching 0, but always negative, And this is approaching this constant. So the whole thing is blowing up toward negative infinity. So this lets me know that this is a vertical asymptote uh, and it's heading toward negative infinity from the left of it and it's heading toward positive infinity from the right of it. Okay, but then what about asymptotes? Well, we want to do uh, a similar trick to before. Uh, so let's find the limit. The limit as x approaches to infinity of square root of 3x squared plus 4 divided by 2x minus 7. Okay, again, we want to note that the biggest power here is a 1. So we want to do the same trick we did before. The limit as x approaches to infinity. And then we'll have 2x minus 7 there, and we want to multiply the numerator and denominator by 1 over x, 1 over x. And in the numerator, we have this thing, square root of 3x squared plus 4. Okay, so the denominator is going to be easy to distribute this. This multiplies by that, and this multiplies by that, no problem. 
But here we have a little issue because we can't just bring in the 1 over x inside the square root. It doesn't work that way. Um, however, if we have two numbers that are both being multiplied and they're both roots, then we can bring them together. So recall that, I'll put a note, that if we have the square root of 7 times the square root of 4x, that in this case we can bring them together under one big happy root and say that this is just going to be 7 times 4x. Good. Okay, so uh, with that, armed with that knowledge, we're going to do a little trick here and rewrite it this way. The limit as x approaches to infinity, and I'm going to rewrite this as 1 over the square root of x squared. The square root of x squared is the x. I'm replacing x by the square root of 1 over x squared. Just in the numerator. Okay, so now when I distribute, I can distribute here and I can distribute there. And then now I can tuck them all under one big happy root and bring in the 1 over x squared inside this root. That's what we'll be able to do. So let's put it over here. This is equal, got my equal signs, this is equal now to the limit as x approaches to infinity of, and I'll have 3x squared divided by x squared plus 4 over x squared and all of that will be inside a square root function. That's just in the numerator. And in the denominator, I'll have a 2x over x minus a 7 over x. Good. All right, so now a bunch of stuff will cancel. This will cancel with that. This will cancel with that. And so I'll have the limit of... I'll have the limit as x approaches to infinity of square root of 3 plus 4 over x squared divided by 2 minus 7 over x. Okay, so following our properties from before, we know that if we have the limit of a fraction like this, that this is equal to the fraction of the two limits, right? The division of the two limits, the limit of the numerator divided by the limit of the denominator. We also know that the limit can be brought inside the root. So to save us a little bit of a couple of steps, I'm going to say that the next logical conclusion is that this is going to be equal to the limit as x approaches to infinity of 3 plus 4 times the limit as x approaches to infinity of 1 over x squared, all of that inside the root. And in the denominator, we have the limit as x approaches to infinity of 2 minus 7 times the limit as x approaches to infinity of 1 over x. Okay, so by theorem 5 in this section, we know that this must be 0 and this must be 0. And the limit as x goes to infinity of the constant 3, well, we know that's just going to be 3 and that this is just going to be 2. So the whole thing simplifies to the square root of 3 divided by 2. So that's our limit. Okay, so the limit as x approaches to infinity of the square root of 3x squared plus 4 all over 2x minus 7 equals to root 3 over 2. What about the negative? Or what about, what happens when the limit approaches negative infinity? Now, what about the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of square root of 3x squared plus 4 all over 2x minus 7? Okay, we're going to apply the same little algebraic trick, the limit as x approaches negative infinity. Well, that's going to be equal to, again, I'm interested in the following. I'm going to do 1 over x and then 1 over x. Keeping note that in this case, I'm letting x be negative numbers. It's heading toward negative infinity, so it's safe to say that x is a negative number. Okay, so then that 
gets multiplied by the square root of 3x squared plus 4. And then here we have 2x minus 7. Right? And then just to refresh your memory, inputs, inputs are negative. So 1 over x is negative. So here's the tricky part. I have to do the same trick as before of rewriting this as 1 over the square root of x squared in order to tuck it inside here. However, I have to introduce an extra negative. So let me show you why. The limit as x approaches to negative infinity. And then I'm going to have this giant fraction. So leaving this part as 1 over x. 2x minus 7. Um, so now if I rewrite this as x squared square rooted all over 1 like this, okay, the square root of x squared is going to be x. Uh, so we're replacing that, except we know that 1 over x is negative. But if I start off with a negative and I square it, and then I take its square root, I automatically make it positive, right? Whenever you take any input and square it, you're going to turn it into a positive. So the result here is that this ends up being positive. So this is not equal to that when x is negative, right? So 1 over x is exactly equal to 1 over the square root of x squared when, we'll say if, x is positive. If x is a positive number, this is true all day long. On the other hand, if x is negative, 1 over x is no longer going to be equal to this. If x is negative, that's negative, this is no longer true because this is a negative number. 1 over a negative number is negative. But if we put a negative in there, square it and uh, take the root, it's going to be positive. So in order to fix this, in order to make this true, we have to do this weird thing of throwing in an extra negative one. Now they're equal to each other, okay? And so that's what we have to do here. We have to toss in an extra negative one in here or just make this negative. So negative one times all of that. Now it's true. Now this, now this can be properly replaced by all that, including that negative. I know, that's tricky. Think about it for a little bit. Okay, so then now we have that times the square root of 3x squared plus 4. And now I'm just going to think about this part to get tucked inside the square root. So that means that this is equal to negative 1. This is equal to the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of negative 1 times, and then I'll have... 3x squared over x squared plus 4 over x squared inside the square root. And all of that gets divided by 2x over x minus 7 over x. And so a bunch of stuff will cancel just like before. That cancels. That goes to, oops, that cancels. Uh, and then this cancels. And so we know that we can use our limit properties to rewrite this. This is going to be equal to negative 1 times, and this will be the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of the number 3, plus 4 times the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of 1 over x squared. Uh, and all of that is inside our root. So this is very similar to before. All over... And then in the denominator, we have the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of just 2 minus 7 times the limit as x approaches to um, negative infinity of just 1 over x squared. And so just, just like we saw before, by theorem 5 of this section, that means that this must be 0, this must be 0. We know this is just the 2, and we know this is just going to be 3. 
So what we get out of this whole thing is that this whole root is equal to, this whole fraction is equal to negative one times root three divided by two. Okay, so we've discovered that there's a vertical asymptote. Well, let's write the limit. So the limit as x approaches to positive infinity of f of x was equal to root three over two. We also found that the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of our function f of x equals to negative root three over two. There's gonna be two horizontal asymptotes and one vertical asymptote. So we have vertical asymptote, f of x has a vertical asymptote at the line x equals to seven over two. And we also have that f of x has a horizontal asymptotes at these two lines. Okay, sorry, it's messy. Still getting used to this technology thing. Okay, so if our function f of x equals to the square root of three x squared plus four all over two x minus seven, we've established that there's a vertical asymptote, asymptote at x equals to seven over two. And we've established that there is horizontal asymptotes at two places um, based on the limit as x goes to positive infinity, you see that there's gonna be a horizontal asymptote at the line y equals to the square root of three over two. And based on the uh, limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x equaling negative uh, root three over two, we see that there's gonna be a horizontal asymptote there. Okay, let's use Desmos to confirm that this works. So, uh, y equals to square root of three over two is this red line. We could see that that is indeed a horizontal asymptote of our function. Uh, the other horizontal asymptote would be y equals to negative root three divided by two. The other horizontal asymptote is here at uh, y equals to negative root three over two. And finally, we have a vertical asymptote at the line x equals to seven divided by two. And so this is what it looked like. So our function f of x in green here was the square root of 3x squared plus 4 divided by 2x minus 7. And we were able to confirm that we had uh, a vertical asymptote at x equals to uh, 7 over 2. And then we saw that the behavior of our function in this direction, the limit as x approaches to positive infinity for our function f of x, it was equal to root three over two. And we saw that in this direction, the limit as x approaches to negative infinity of our function f of x, it looked like it was heading toward negative root three over two. So those become uh, horizontal asymptotes. So our function had horizontal asymptotes at y equals to root three over two and at y equals to negative root three over two. So this is another example of having two horizontal asymptotes, one for the case when x goes toward positive infinity and a new or a different horizontal asymptote as x goes toward negative infinity. The big thing to take away from here is this algebraic trick that we used here. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense, uh, but we use this kind of thing all the time, right? How do we manipulate algebraic manipulations that we can use uh, to help us uh, figure out the limits. Okay, so let's think about this one. The limit as x goes to infinity of 
and then we have the square root of 4x squared plus 5 minus 2x. Um, where is this heading? Well, notice that this is getting very large. As we input values, as we input very large positive numbers, so large positive numbers go in here, and then we square it, and then we multiply by 4, and then we add 5, we're getting an even larger positive number. When we have a really, really huge positive number, and we take the square root of it, we still get a very large positive number, minus twice whatever the input is. So if, again, we're inputting a very large positive number, large positive, um, what we end up with is a large positive minus a large positive. So there's a temptation to want to do the following. The limit as x approaches to infinity of the square root of 4x squared plus 5 minus the limit as x approaches to infinity of 2x. So that is valid. We're allowed to separate this into the limit of the first one minus the limit of the second one. And we know that we can tuck the limit inside here and uh, we know that this is going to just grow and grow and grow. And so this is going to grow toward infinity. And that this is also going to grow toward infinity. Toward infinity. Uh, so then people then write this as infinity minus infinity. They cancel each other out and they get a zero. And that's not necessarily true, right? Because uh, even though this first one is growing toward infinity, it might be growing to infinity much faster than that one, right? Maybe this one, uh, maybe this one is doubling, right? Whatever you input it, we double it. But this one might be growing so much faster that uh, it, even though you're subtracting that number, it might still be growing toward infinity. We might have a situation where this equation uh, might be written in a way where it grows much slower than the equation over here. So maybe this one grows to infinity faster. When I subtract them, they might be heading toward infin negative infinity. Or they might grow at the same speed and kind of cancel each other out and give you a zero. So we really just can't conclude this. This, this is not true. We have to be careful. We have to avoid this infinity mi minus infinity. What we can do is we could have a large positive plus a large positive. So if we had a large positive number plus another large positive number, that I can safely conclude will be equal to a large positive number. So notation-wise, we can adopt this notation of a uh, uh, a positive infinity plus a positive infinity equals a positive infinity. Something that's infinitely large in the positive direction plus another infinitely large number from the positive direction, we're adding them, they grow toward, we're going to get something uh, very large in the positive side. Okay. Uh, likewise, we can also do multiplication. If we have a very large positive number and we multiply it by another very large positive number, Again, I don't know what the actual number is going to be, but I know that it's going to go toward very large positive infinity di direction. Okay, um, So we want to take advantage of these things in order to simplify this and then use a little bit of algebra magic to manipulate this in a way that will help us figure out uh, what the limit is. Okay, So don't, don't just conclude negative infi uh, in infinity minus infinity. When you get to that, we know we have a problem, we have to do more work. Okay, the little trick we want to employ here is to first of all think of this as one big happy fraction. We can always do that by putting a one underneath anything, right? And then what we want to do is multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate of it. So we're going to multiply it by the square root of 4x squared plus 5 plus 2x divided by the same thing, 4x squared plus 5 plus 2x. And what that does for us is that the numerator now, um, the product of these two binomials, they are uh, conjugate binomials. So we know that uh, the result is going to be a difference of squares. right? So we know that this equals to 
the limit as x approaches to infinity of the first one squared minus the second one squared. This is going to be this squared minus this squared. And in the denominator, we're just going to leave that alone. That equals to square root of 4x squared plus 5 plus 2x. Okay. And remember this, let's just put it off to the side in case you forget, you forget why. If we multiply something a plus b times a minus b, these are conjugates of, of each other, uh, conjugate binomials. They look identical in every way, shape, and form, except one has a plus, one has a minus. And we know that when we FOIL these, if we FOIL them, we get a squared minus ab plus ab minus b squared. The middle terms cancel, and what we have left over is a squared minus b squared, right? One term squared minus the other term squared. Well, that's what we have here. We created conjugate pairs because this is a subtraction. Here is an addition. Everything else is identical. So when I FOIL them, the middle terms will cancel out, and all that remains is one term squared minus the other term squared, and that's why we have this. Okay. So now the square root of all of this squared is just going to be whatever is inside here, right? This and this are inverse operations. They cancel each other out. So it'll be this minus 4x squared okay. so the square root and the squared cancel each other out they're inverse operations so we're just left with 4x squared plus 5 that's how we get that minus uh, 4x squared and now those two will luckily cancel each other out so this will cancel with that and all that survives in the numerator is going to be that 5 so this is going to be equal to the limit as x approaches to infinity of, and then we just have a 5 there, and then we have this 4x squared plus 5 plus 2x in the denominator. And now I can use my rules of limits to say that this is going to be equal to the limit as x approaches to infinity of just 5 divided by the limit as x approaches to infinity of the denominator. And the limit as x approaches to infinity of just 5 is just going to be 5. And the denominator is getting infinitely large, right? So as x, as x grows toward infinity, I know that this denominator is also going to be growing toward infinity. And notice, very crucially here, that we have an addition, not a subtraction. That's what the big difference is. Up here where we started, we had a subtraction. So we ended up with this case of infinity minus infinity, and we don't know what that is. But here we have something that's growing toward infinity. So this guy is going to be growing toward infinity, positive, plus, and then this guy is also going to be growing toward infinity. So the whole denominator is growing toward positive infinity. Therefore, the whole thing will be growing toward 5 divided by a positive infinity. And if the fraction, if we have a fraction where the numerator is a constant, the denominator is getting infinitely large in the positive direction, you know the whole thing is growing towards zero. So that's the limit of this answer. So it turns out that in this case, these two are kind of growing at the same speed. Therefore, they're both going toward infinity, but they kind of cancel each other out and they end up going toward zero in this case. Okay? But there will be cases where the answer is that they grow toward positive infinity. Maybe this one just grows much faster than that one, so they grow toward infinity or negative infinity, or they might grow toward some other constant. Maybe they cancel each other out and they converge toward the number 5, for example. Okay? All right, so we have to be careful. When you see something that results in infinity minus infinity, more work is necessary to figure out what the answer is. One of those algebraic tricks that might help you is this one. Think about multiplying it by the conjugate. So just to bring it all together, the limit as x approaches to infinity 
Take the square root of 4x squared plus 5 minus 2x equals 0. Okay, so let's use Desmos to confirm our results. And there's our graph. We see that as x grows toward positive infinity, this whole thing will converge towards zero. It gets infinitely close toward the x-axis. So in this direction over here, we'd say that the limit as x approaches to positive infinity of f of x, which is square root of 4x squared plus 5 minus 2x, is equal to zero. That's how we describe that there is a horizontal asymptote at the line y equals to zero. Okay, evaluate the limit as x approaches to three from the right-hand side of cotan inverse of one over three minus x. Okay, to think about this, note that just the inside part of it, if we figured out the limit as x approaches to 3 from the right-hand side of 1 over 3 minus x, uh, from the right-hand side, in other words, if we let x be a number close to 3 but always a little bit larger, then the denominator is going to grow towards 0 but always a small negative number. So we know that this is growing toward negative infinity. As x grows toward 3 from the right side, from the right hand side, then 3 minus x is always a very small negative number, is a very small negative decimal close to zero okay so as x approaches to three from the right hand side from the right hand side then three minus x is a very small negative decimal number close to zero and so now 1 over 3 minus x is going to be heading toward negative infinity. Okay? And as we head toward negative infinity, we think about the graph of cotangent inverse. Right, let's, graph, uh, let's look at the graph of cotangent inverse. So here is the graph of tangent of x. Here is the graph of tangent of x. And we know that it has... Um, Let's restrict the domain. So we know it repeats itself over and over, but we can restrict it to just one period by letting uh, x be... So we know that the tangent function will continue to repeat itself, but usually write it for one period, which is from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. And then usually we also draw in those um, vertical asymptotes. So Okay, so that's tangent. Now, cotangent is 1 over tangent, so we know that that's just going to redirect this. So here is y equals to cotangent of x. And it changes the period. Usually we, we note down one period from 0 through pi. Okay, so there's one period of cotangent x. And so normally we write down those asymptotes. Let me get rid of the tangent then. So then this one is going to go to pi. From 0 to pi. Okay, so there's one period of cotangent. 
And now if we think about inverse cotangent, this would be that purple one is what it looks like, right? So if we just um, find the inverse of cotangent, it'll look like that, that purple one. And then of course, it'll have horizontal asymptotes at zero and at, uh, at pi. Okay, so hopefully that looks familiar from your uh, trig class. So this is okay. So we can we can see that this is our cotan inverse function, and as x grows toward negative infinity, the output values grow toward pi. The limit as x grows toward 3 from the right hand side of uh, cotan inverse, inverse here, of this function equals to pi. Cotan inverse of x, and we know that this is a horizontal asymptote at y equals to pi and at y equals to 0. So this behavior over here can be characterized as the limit as x grows toward negative infinity of cotan inverse of x equals to pi. It's heading toward pi, infinitely close to pi as the input values grow toward negative infinity. Right? As the input values grow toward negative infinity, the output values of this cotan inverse function grow toward pi. Okay, so then we combine that with uh, the fact that we have some function inside here that's growing toward negative infinity. And that's how we get this answer above. Okay. So our answer is going to be right here, pi. Without doing much work, notice that the limit the limit as x approaches to 3 from the left-hand side of cotan inverse of 1 over 3 minus x. This time, if we input values close to 3 but always a little bit less than 3, then this is going to be some very, very small positive number. So as x grows toward 3 from the left-hand side, then uh, 3 minus x is going to grow towards 0 uh, from the right hand side. So in other words, it's going to stay positive. Therefore, 1 over 3 minus x is going to grow toward positive infinity. And so we see that cotan inverse uh, of an input value that's growing toward positive infinity is going to grow toward 0. So then we would conclude that the limit as x approaches to 3 from the left-hand side of cotan inverse of 1 over 3 minus x equals 0. This is all connected to our understanding of the graph of cotangent of inverse and understanding that as the input values grow toward positive infinity, cotan inverse will head toward zero. So if the input value is actually a function uh, such that that function will grow toward, uh, toward positive or negative infinity, then we'll be able to tell what our uh, functions, what our values are going to be. Okay, so another notation for this, or writing this in, in notation, uh, you might see something that looks like this, the limit as x approaches to 3 from the right-hand side of cotan 
cotan inverse of 1 over 3 minus x is equal to the limit as oops, equal the limit as say a goes toward negative infinity of cotan inverse of a which is going to be equal to pi or the other one, the limit as x approaches to 3 from the left-hand side of cotan inverse of 1 over 3 minus x is equal to the limit of, say, b approaching a positive infinity of cotan inverse of b, which we saw in this case equals to 0. Okay. And so that's where we're replacing this variable a, which is this function inside here, by this limit as it goes toward negative infinity, because we understand that this is heading toward negative infinity. And then over here, we're replacing this uh, by b as the limit as b goes to infinity, understanding that the limit as x grows toward 3 from the left-hand side of this is going to be equivalent to the limit as b goes to infinity uh, here. Okay, So just a slight notational difference. Um, so if you want to make that variable change, that's fine. Otherwise, you can just kind of write it out and you know kind of go through the logic as as x grows toward 3 from the right-hand side, that means that this denominator is going to grow toward 0 but stay negative. Therefore, the whole thing goes toward negative infinity. Uh, therefore, we can say that this is equivalent to the cotan inverse function where the input is growing toward negative infinity. And we can see from our graph that it equals to pi in this case. OK, so I hope that's clear. Okay, evaluate the limit as x approaches 2 from the left-hand side of e to the power of 1 over x minus 2. Okay, well, there's going to be a whole bunch of um, functions that we have to deal with that involve e and e to the power of x. So hopefully you remember what that looks like. Let's, let's refresh our memories. Remember that e looks like this. Uh, here is the standard graph of e to the x power uh, and then a few easy uh, or one easy value on the function is this one 0 comma 1 so if we put a 0 in there e to the 0 power is 1 so let's wrote that write that down so note that e to the 0 power equals to 1 so we have the ordered pair right there which is 0 comma 1 is definitely one point on the graph, which is this one. And now if we input negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and so on and so forth, here's a table of values that confirm for us that the graph is growing toward 0. So the behavior over here, we're going to uh, note that the limit as x approaches to negative infinity on the function e to the x, that that's growing toward 0. On the other hand, if, um, if uh, x is growing toward positive infinity, that's not true. It seems to be growing that way. Okay, all right, so there is a horizontal asymptote. So e to the x has a horizontal asymptote at y equals to zero or the x-axis. Okay, so we're going to depend on our understanding of e to the x, uh, the function e to the x, to do more complicated situations where instead of just having e to the power of x, we have e to the power of some function of x, and then that function value might grow toward positive or negative infinity, or it might grow toward some constant. Okay, so let's go back to our example. Okay, so just like before, we can kind of um, think our way through it. So as x grows toward 2 
from the negatives uh, from the left side from the left side then that must mean that x minus 2 must be some very very small negative number it is a small negative decimal close to zero, right? Like as we approach two from the left-hand side, x could be 1.99999. And so 1.99999 minus two is gonna be a very, very small negative decimal number. And so if we have one divided by something that's becoming a very small negative decimal, then this whole fraction is growing toward negative infinity. Okay, all right, so if this is growing toward negative infinity, then we can say the following. The limit as x approaches to two from the left-hand side of e to the one over x minus two is equivalent to e to the, pick a letter, doesn't matter, how about capital Q, e to the Q power, where this is the limit as Q is growing toward negative infinity. Where Q is growing toward negative infinity. And as we saw uh, a second ago, the graph of E lets me know that this is growing toward zero. Okay. So just in general, E looks like this, comes this way, comes that way. And we know that it has this sort of a shape so that as the input values of x grow toward negative infinity, as these x values grow toward negative infinity that way, toward negative infinity, the output values are going to get closer and closer and closer and closer to zero. They get arbitrarily close to zero. Okay. So again, you could just write out your answers. I would be okay. Uh, say on a test if you just wrote out your your logic line by line by line and then you know reached your conclusion or um, if you get used to this style of notation right then this is saying that um, we can replace this by a Q so we're replacing this by this letter Q and the limit as q goes to negative infinity. So the limit as x grows to 2 from the left-hand side is being replaced by these two things. So this combined is telling you the same thing as these things here. Oh, I guess I should finish this thought out here. So 1 over x approaches negative infinity, thus um, e to the 1 over x minus 2 approaches to 0. Right, so all of this up here is the same thing as these three lines, uh, just kind of compacted. Say we had something like this, then we know that the wrong thing to do would be to think about this, the limit as x approaches to infinity of x squared minus 5 times the limit as x approaches infinity of x, and then go, well, this goes toward infinity and this grows toward infinity, so therefore we end up with an infinity minus infinity situation, right? So don't conclude that this equals to zero. It's not true. Uh, but what we can do, this is actually a fairly easy one. All we have to do is factor it, and we get to something that's really easy to do. The limit as x approaches to infinity of, we get x times x minus 5. And this is going to be something that grows toward infinity times something that grows toward positive infinity. They both grow toward positive infinity. So this can easily be concluded to be infinity. Because x grows toward infinity x minus 5 grows toward infinity, right? This is as x grows toward infinity, then just the x goes toward infinity, and the x minus 5 is also going to go toward infinity. 
So we can just conclude that the multiplication of x times x minus 5 has got to be growing toward infinity. Okay, so sometimes it's really easy, just have to manipulate it a little bit, and we can conclude that uh, uh, something that's growing toward infinity plus something that's growing toward infinity is just going to be infinity, and something that's growing toward positive infinity being multiplied by something that's growing toward positive infinity, we can just conclude that that's going to grow toward positive infinity. It's just this something that's growing to infinity minus something that's growing toward infinity that's what causes a problem, right? That's the only one where we cannot conclude that it equals to zero. We have to do something else. So this is the precise definition of the limit at infinity. So let f be a function uh, defined on some interval from a to infinity. Then the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equals to l means that for every epsilon greater than zero, there is a corresponding number capital of n such that if x is greater than capital N, then uh, f of x minus L is less than epsilon. Okay, so what does this say? Uh, we're trying to show, we're trying to show that uh, as the input values grow toward infinity, that this f of x function will get infinitely close to L. If it's infinitely close to L, that means that when we subtract them, it should be a very small number, that their difference is small. Right? That's what happens when two values are really close to each other. You subtract them, and they're going to be really, really small. So imagine that you're trying to convince somebody that this one is getting arbitrarily close to that one, and they tell you that um, in order to be convinced, they want to see that this is 0 0.0001 units away from L. Right? They're going to give you how close they want, them, they, they want these two to be to each other. That's what this epsilon is some very, very small positive number that represents the gap, the distance between the f of x and the l. So in order to convince them that that's true, um, you're going to be able to find some capital N value such that all the inputs beyond that capital N will result in um, a difference between the f of x and the l to be less than the given value of, uh, of epsilon. Okay, so let me show you this is a picture to go with that. So here is a picture that goes with that. So remember, you're trying to show that this f of x function is converging toward L. It's getting infinitely close to capital L. And so the person you're trying to convince will provide for you an epsilon. Arbitrarily speak, just to, just to pick something, maybe they say epsilon has to be within 0 0.01. If you can show me that the function is within 0 0.01 of capital L, uh, then I'll be convinced. So what you do is you find some capital N such that all the input values, all the X values chosen that are beyond capital N will result in F of X values that are always within that epsilon window. If you can always do that, no matter what epsilon they give you, then that's the formal definition that the f of x is getting infinitely close to the L. Okay, so um, don't worry too much about the formal definition of, uh, of this limit. Uh, we really don't spend too much time on that. So if that helped, good. If not, don't worry about it. Let's take a look at some of your homework problems. Okay. Exercises for 2.6. Um, so these should be pretty easy, I hope. They're just interpreting uh, the graphs. And this is the one I worked on in the video. So uh, this is probably the one in your homework. Um, so those should be pretty easy, I think. Uh, what about when we have equations? So say problems 15 through 42. Uh, these will be cases where we need to take advantage of uh, the trick where you multiply the numerator and denominator by 1 over x to the power of the highest degree uh, observed in the denominator. So this one we would want to do 1 over x divided by 1 over x, and that'll fix it. This one we would want to do 1 over x cubed over 1 over x cubed, and that'll take care of that. Um, 
Same with this one, 1 over x cubed over 1 over x cubed, 1 over x squared over 1 over x squared. Uh, this one's a little trickier, but uh, this is the highest power in the denominator, so multiply the numerator and the denominator by 1 over t to the 3 over 2, or the 1.5 power for both the numerator and the denominator. Don't forget that the square root of t is the same as t to the power of 1 half, and then we can simplify this to be t to the power of 1 and a half, 1.5 or 3 over 2, right? So this should be t to the power of 3 over 2. Uh, something like this is also interesting. I, again, uh, we want to multiply uh, the denominator by 1 over the square root of x to the power of 4. Um, that way they reduce, and we want to do the same thing with the numerator. So uh, the square root of 1 over x to the fourth power both the numerator and denominator. So I should take care of that one. And so same sort of tricks for these guys. Uh, here, obviously, we have the conjugates. So multiply by, the, by, the, by its conjugate, numerator and denominator. Just put a little one underneath this. So those should be good. Uh, remember that the limit as x goes to infinity of cosine of x is does not exist right since it keeps oscillating back and forth between negative one and one uh, so the limit as x goes to infinity of cosine of 3x is still going to not exist because multiplying the input by 3 doesn't change the fact that we keep oscillating between negative one and one and it never converges to any specific value keep that in mind mm. Find the horizontal and vertical asymptotes of each curve. Uh, okay, so for 47 through 52, um, for these guys in particular, we have um, a giant fraction where we have a polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator, and we're asked to find the horizontal and vertical asymptotes. So notice the following pattern that occurs with rational functions. So when you're dealing with a rational function, rational function. In other words, you're going to have a polynomial in the numerator and some other polynomial uh, in the denominator. And polynomials can be expressed in two ways. We can have sort of the expanded version of it. So expanded, expanded. polynomial or um, we can factor it all down and we can have the factored form of the polynomial for example just to throw one out there um, I could have something like this. I could have x plus 2, x minus 3, like that. Um, and up here, I could have x plus 1, um, x plus 4, right? So this is a factored polynomial. And then I could FOIL it all out and get the expanded form. So if I expand this whole thing out, I'll end up with x squared uh, plus... Well, actually, you know what? Let me let me throw in an extra number in here because I want it to equal something. So let's make this a two, and let's make this a five. Okay. So then that, if I foil it all out, I end up with two uh, x squared, two x squared, plus eight, minus uh, plus one makes it plus nine, plus nine x plus four. That's the expanded version of that. And if I expand this whole thing out, I end up with 5x squared, 5x squared, minus 15 plus 2 makes it minus 13x, minus 6. Okay, well, we can use algebra to go back and forth between these. Sometimes it's a lot of work. Sometimes it's not so bad. But we can go back and forth with some algebra skills there. 
Okay, now in terms of vertical and horizontal asymptotes, uh, having it in the factored form helps a lot for vertical asymptotes. and holes, holes in the graph. Whereas having it in the expanded form is helpful for the horizontal asymptotes. Okay, if we have um, a polynomial expanded all out and we wanna look for the horizontal asymptotes, what we wanna do is focus our attention on the term in the poly uh, the polynomial term in the numerator that has the highest degree usually we like to write it in descending order so it's usually going to be the one in front but that's not always the case they might trick you where they you know there might be a case where uh, this thing is like this maybe and so this would be the one that we're interested in because it's got the highest degree and it's you know written in the middle of it but you know usually, we like to write them in descending order, so it's usually going to be the one in front. It's just the customary thing we do. Okay, so we're going to kind of ignore the rest of it for the purpose of figuring out horizontal asymptotes, and we're going to think about that ratio and pull it off to the side. So in this little case, that means that I would take this and go over here and just think about 2x squared over 5x squared. And we're going to focus our attention on just these guys, the powers. And we wanna figure out if those powers are the same, like they are in this case. If those powers are the same, then that means that there will be a horizontal asymptote at y equals to the numbers in front. So in the way I've written it right now, this indicates that there will be a horizontal asymptote at the line at y equals to 2 fifths, right? That's what that means, because they match. And now there's nothing special about 2, they just have to match. So for example, it could be that they give me a polynomial and I pull it off to the side, and maybe this is like 8 over 8. I'm like, oh, they match. Okay, so horizontal asymptote at 2 fifths. As long as those powers match, the biggest one in the numerator, the biggest one in the denominator, they match, they're growing at the same speed, they're growing at the same rate, so for that reason, they'll kind of cancel each other out. And uh, eventually, as x goes toward positive infinity, uh, this whole thing will converge toward that. So there will be a horizontal asymptote at y equals to 2 fifths, right? When x is a small number, all these other things have an impact, the 9, the 4, the negative 13. Uh, so who knows what my answer is going to be. But as x goes toward infinity, this is going to be uh, as x grows toward infinity, we will see that the ones that have the biggest exponent are going to outrun the rest by so much that the rest will not really have any impact at all. These will dominate what happens to my final answer. Um, and, also, and also keep in mind there might be a sign involved. So if this was negative 2 here, then this would be negative, which means this would be negative. So you have to keep track of the sign as well. Okay, another thing that could happen though is that maybe the exponent in the denominator is bigger than the one in the numerator. So for example, if the given one, if the given uh, uh, polynomial has a 7 there and a 2 there, I pull off that guy over to the side and I analyze it, and I go, okay, well, this one has a 2, this one has a 7. This will be a case where this guy is smaller than that guy. If the denominator is bigger than that one, this one's smaller than that one, that means that the denominator, the polynomial denominator, is going to grow so much faster than the one in the numerator that it will all grow towards 0. Okay, so in a case like this, as x grows toward positive infinity, there will be a horizontal asymptote at y equals to 0. Okay, it will grow toward 0. Right? That's when this thing is bigger than that one. And then finally, the other case, the other way around, 
is going to be the case where the one in the numerator is bigger. So like maybe this is a five and this is like a three. Like, okay, you pull that off to the side and you think about it, just the, the term in the numerator that has the biggest degree. So then this is a five and this is a three. So when we think about it and we focus on the five and the three, this one's bigger than that one. That means that it's gonna to grow toward, in, uh, toward positive or negative infinity. It's gonna grow out of control in one of the two directions. We just don't know which. And in that case, now you're gonna to have to think about it. What are you inputting? Are you inputting very large positive numbers or very large negative numbers? Are you raising it to, a po uh, to an even power or to an odd power? If it's an even power, then you know that any input, positive or negative, will result in a positive output. And we know that if we're inputting negative uh, values as x goes toward negative infinity, uh, we're going to preserve the sign. Also, we have to keep track of whether the coefficients in front are positive or negative. So it's more of a thinking situation. Okay, but we know it's going to go toward positive or negative infinity. You just have to figure out which one of those two it is. Okay, so in a case like this, when this is larger than that, then as x grows toward positive or negative infinity, positive or negative infinity, there will be no horizontal asymptote. The function will grow, f of x will grow toward positive or negative infinity. You need to decide which is which. Okay, so that one's worth uh, some more thinking. All right, um, let's use uh, Desmos to confirm that stuff. Okay, so here is the case the, that we were looking at, this polynomial. Um, and notice this is the case where they both match. They both have an x squared term in the numerator and the denominator. So they will converge toward the line uh, 2 fifths. 2 fifths is equal to 0.4. So if we just graph the line y equals to 2 fifths, 2 divided by 5, that's going to be 0.4. Let's put it in red. And remember, we care about what happens at infinity, right? When x equals to uh, 1, when it equals to 2, that, that doesn't matter. We want to let x grow out to infinity. And we see that eventually the function, which is in blue, gets infinitely close to our red line, which we saw was the line 2 fifths, right? And it does that in both directions. So there is a horizontal asymptote at two fifths because they match. Now, if I change this to be something else, but they still match. So let's say this is a seven and this is a seven. Doesn't matter. The graph changes a little bit, but we're still going to have the exact same horizontal asymptote because they match. Okay. Seven, seven, it's going to be two fifths, right? And there's nothing special about two fifths. So like, let's say maybe this is 10 over five, which means that they'll have a horizontal asymptote at two, 10 over five. So let's change this over to two. There it is. There's my horizontal asymptote at two. Okay, so when they match, then the division of the two numbers in front will tell you what that horizontal asymptote is. And if one of them is negative, like let's say this is negative, then my horizontal asymptote would be at negative two. Negative two. Let me zoom out. There it is. Okay, so when they match, it's the easiest case. On the other hand, if they don't match, if the power in the numerator is smaller than the one in the denominator, then the whole thing will grow towards zero. So let's say that the power in the denominator is that seven and the power in the numerator is uh, three then you see how the horizontal asymptote is no longer down there. It is just the x-axis. So it's just going to be y equals to zero. That becomes our new horizontal asymptote. And that's going to be true whenever it's true that the power is smaller. It doesn't even have to be dramatically smaller. It could be just something like a six. And uh, it might take longer for the function to approach the x-axis, but it's still going to do it. Right, so the x-axis is still a horizontal asymptote. Okay, now uh, the other slightly more complicated case is when it's the other way around. 
when the power up here is bigger than the one in the denominator. So let's say this one is a nine. Ah, this might look a little bit better. We see that the function is just growing toward negative infinity quite fast, even at negative eight or positive eight. We see that it's already growing quite quickly toward negative infinity. Um, on the other hand, if this constant here was uh, a positive, instead of negative 10, x to the ninth, it was positive, then they would both be heading toward positive infinity. Um, let's so if there's a five there and a three here, right, this is again a case where the uh, power in the numerator is bigger than the power in the denominator. Uh, so it's gonna be one of the infinities, positive and negative infinity. As x goes toward positive infinity, we see from our graph that the function is growing toward positive infinity. As x grows toward negative infinity, we see from our graph that it's growing toward positive infinity as well. However, if there was something like a, a negative in here, a negative uh, two, well then things change. Now they both seem to be heading toward negative infinity. So uh, that one is the trickier one. When we have the case where the power in the numerator is bigger than the power in the denominator, then we have to think about uh, the coefficients in front and we have to think about what happens to our values uh, when they're being raised to a power that's either even or odd. Do the negative signs get preserved or do they get canceled out? So if, for example, this changed to a four, now we have a case where the function is growing toward positive infinity as x grows toward negative infinity, and then the function is growing toward negative infinity as x grows out to positive infinity, right? So the point is that it gets a little more complicated uh, in, in those situations. You'll have to think about it and figure out which one it is. The good news is you know for a fact that it's uh, gonna be positive or negative infinity. So just think about what happens when you input a large positive, you know, it's the power of five, it stays positive times a negative two becomes a big negative, right? So you can kind of uh, uh, walk through the signs and see whether your answer is gonna be positive or negative by just focusing on the first two terms. Um, and you know the answer is infinity, so uh, figure out whether it's positive or negative infinity from there. Okay, so that is all about finding the horizontal asymptotes as x grows toward positive or negative infinity. On the other hand, if we factor our polynomial like this, um, then the places where, or the, the input values of x, where the denominator uh, results in a zero, are either gonna be vertical asymptotes or they're gonna be holes. Um, how do we know which is which? Well, if the complete factored form like this one does not cancel any of these values, any of these binomials, then you have yourself a vertical asymptote. On the other hand, if one of them do cancel, then you have yourself a whole. So for example, the way they're written right now, um, this is indicating that we'll have a vertical asymptote. So the way it's written right now, because nothing can cancel, uh, this is really leading me to believe that there's a vertical asymptote at x, so vertical asymptote at x equals to negative two fifths, because that's what would cause a zero in the denominator, and another vertical asymptote at x equals to positive three, okay? On the other hand, if this whole factored out polynomial was something that resulted in this, instead of a plus four there, we had a minus three there, therefore these cancel, then that would mean that this is not a vertical asymptote, that the function has a whole at x equals to three, right? If they canceled, we have a whole. If they don't cancel, then we have a vertical asymptote. Okay, so let's look at Desmos. Okay, so for example, if I had this function, f of x equals two, and then we have a factored form of a rational function, in the numerator I have x minus three times x plus two divided by x minus two times x plus three, nothing cancels, so that means I have two vertical asymptotes, one of them at x equals to positive two, and another one at x equals to negative three, okay? 
On the other hand, if one of them did cancel, so for example, this factored form of the numerator had a minus 2 up here, minus 2, then there would no longer be a, whole, uh, a vertical asymptote at x equals to 2. And Desmos doesn't really do a good job, but there would be a little hole there, a little hole there when the input is equal to positive 2. The negative 3 doesn't cancel, so there would be a vertical asymptote there. Okay, let's try something else. If we have another term down here, like x minus 5, well, now we have another vertical asymptote there. Okay, so now we have a vertical asymptote at positive 5, x equals to 5, a vertical asymptote at x equals to negative 3, and then because these two cancel, that means we have a hole at x equals to 2. There should be a little hole right in there. It's kind of hard, you know, Desmos doesn't really do a good job of that part, but we could see it there. Okay, all right, so polynomials in their factored form are very helpful to be able to identify where the vertical asymptotes are and where the holes are. Um, and if we expand out our polynomial and focus on just the first two leading terms, uh, we can use that to determine whether there's horizontal asymptotes. Okay, that information should be helpful when you're dealing with these questions from your homework, right? So it's given to you in expanded form every time for these guys um, in order to figure out whether there is a vertical asymptote, you need to factor it, factor the numerator, factor the denominator, factor the numerator, factor the denominator, and then that'll help you figure out when there's vertical asymptotes versus holes. Um, if it further wants to do, identify what happens to the function near the vertical asymptote, is it going toward positive infinity? Is it going toward negative infinity? Well, that's a different beast altogether, right? We have to think about the limit as x approaches that constant from the left or from the right and determine whether it's going to positive or negative infinity. Um, so that, that would take a little bit of work. Okay. All right. So hopefully that's helpful for these. Um... Okay, I think that should be more than enough to help you get through your homework. So uh, try it out and let me know if you have any problems.